Um, first of all, thanks you uh, all for coming, and hopefully you can all hear me in the back, but if not, okay, good. Uh, but if I start to sound a bit quiet, I'll stand up. Uh, and thank you, Mandy, for the introduction. That was really lovely. Um, and just a note of thanks for the Kenyan as well for inviting me to do the talk tonight, and of course to Salim Tamari for agreeing to act as discussant. Um, I'll start off, I mean, I've made some notes, but you know, we'll see if I get through half of them. Um, I think what I'll start off with is just to mention that the book is um, a few years in the making. It was the idea behind it, and a lot of what's in the book comes from the PhD thesis I did um, a few years ago at SOAS in London. And so after I finished the PhD, I sort of took a couple of years to shape it into the monograph uh, that came out a month or so ago. And sort of the impetus for the idea behind writing something on citizenship in Mandate Palestine uh, came from <clears throat> a few different things really, but one being that in a lot of sort of more standard or older histories of the Palestine Mandate and even sort of late Ottoman Palestine, there's not so much of a mention of conceptions of nationality and conceptions of citizenship uh, in a legal sense, for one, but then also in a kind of a discursive or practical sense. So what it meant to be a national uh, or a Palestinian uh, citizen after the mandate started, or then of course before what Palestinian Arabs, Palestinian um, also Palestinian Jews who had been resident here for quite some time, how they conceived of themselves as Ottoman nationals or how nationality, how citizenship was sort of conceived of in the late 19th century, pre-First World War, and then how that changed after the British came to Palestine. And so I tried to look at, in the book and in the, in the thesis before, citizenship as a term, first of all, um, I suppose, in a sense, when we think of citizenship, it's not always, for the case of, of uh, Mandate Palestine, there's not much that's been done on it. Um, a little bit from the legal framework, but very little about how citizenship evolved as a term, as a practice, and also as a behavior among uh, the population of Palestine. And it's not really a clear-cut term from previous histories of the Mandate. Uh, and it's surely a term that has been contested by the British, the Zionist movement, uh, Palestinian Arabs in what became the Mandate of Palestine, but also importantly what I'll talk about in a little bit for Palestinian Arabs who happened to leave Palestine pre-First World War, during, after the First World War, and then when this whole change of the British mandate comes into place, what happens to these people who are left kind of outside of the territory of Palestine? Citizenship becomes a very contested status and something that um, was quite problematic for many of these emigrants in the diaspora long before 1947, 1948. And there was sort of a constant struggle from the early 20s onward, really, for these uh, emigrants in places like the, the Americas, Europe, also close by, say in Egypt, to actually get citizenship as a status, an internationally recognized status conferred upon them by, by the British and also by the League of Nations. <clears throat> and the term citizenship and nationality, both in the legal sense during the mandate and also, um, maybe I should say here, a lot of the, the materials that the book is based on are not only British colonial records, British archival records, but also Arabic newspapers, memoirs, uh, <clears throat> records of uh, discussions by different civil society groups, different civil society actors, uh, leaders in the, uh, the nationalist movement. This term citizenship and nationality, these were constantly contested by all of these different actors, by the British, both in Palestine um, I won't go so much into to the structure of the mandate, but in the question and answer, if you do have questions about that, I can, I can talk about it. But essentially the way that Britain was run, uh, or that Britain ran Palestine as kind of a direct, almost a direct colony, citizenship was thought of very differently by the British who were actually here implementing legislation, including the citizenship order. 
than it was thought about in London and the way that Great Britain applied citizenship and nationality laws in other colonies, in Egypt, in Iraq under the mandate. Uh, it was very different the way it was thought of here than, than how the French, for instance, applied nationality and citizenship in Syria or in Lebanon. And so the terminology is constantly changing, and I've tried to track that throughout the chapters of the book, both the way that the British sort of saw the term citizenship and nationality, but also in the Arabic press and in uh, different forums as well, in, like I said, civil societies, nationalist meetings, how citizenship and nationality evolved as a discursive term uh, in those forums as well. <clears throat> And the book also aims to trace the way that citizens were made in kind of a practical sense. So the sort of social, the political, cultural, um, civic behaviors of citizenship, how those were implemented in a sense, or sort of how the British sought to implement what those terms were to mean for the population of Palestine. And also how, the book also traces how claims to citizenship were made. So not only by emigrants that were in the diaspora, as I, as I mentioned before, but different groups within Palestine. Uh, I mainly look at, as I said, Arabic records and British records. Uh, but I do mention in the book here and there uh, where, it's, where it's important and where it's relevant, um, <clears throat> how different Jewish Palestinians also, so Jewish Palestinian citizens of the mandate, also thought of themselves as citizens. Um, but I believe some other work has been done on Hebrew on this topic. And so this is mostly focused on the Arab population. Um, but of course, that's not to say that there's not a lot more work that can and, and maybe should be done by other historians of the mandate. The book, um, as Mandy said, and, and as you can see from the title, it covers the entire period of the mandate. And I'm looking, it, try, it, it looks at both, as I said, the British conception of citizenship and also the Arab conception. And I try to put a good deal of focus on the Arab side. And so, sorry, the mic. Um, <laughs> one, one of the main points that I have tried to... Good, yeah, I think so. <laughs> it's the transformation from the idea of Ottoman nationality into a colonial citizenship for the Arab population and the way that discourses changed um, for those who were still here in Palestine. Again, not those who, who had left, I'll talk about in a minute. And there was um, a particular framework, I suppose, after, say, the mid-1920s that emerged from the historical record about, about citizenship and nationality. And there is this idea that the British sort of legislation was, in a sense, imposed on the majority Arab population. And there were many attempts starting from as early as 1918, 1919, so even before the final armistices had been signed uh, to end uh, the state of war between, between Turkey and the Allied powers different groups sort of struggling to actually control what citizenship would be in the mandate. And so you have from as early as 1918, the Zionist organization and, and Heim Weizmann trying to press a very specific idea of Palestinian citizenship to uh, British committees in London, a bit later on to the British High Commissioner and British committees here in, in Palestine under the mandate. Um, and a very specific concept of how citizenship should be passed for the new immigrants, the new Jewish immigrants to, to the mandate territory. Um, and this was very much in, I suppose, in tension, as you might imagine, with the way that um, many Arab, Palestinian Arab groups conceived of citizenship and how, specifically how citizenship and nationality should pass um, between generations, essentially. Uh, I suppose, just to set the frame a little bit more, Palestinian citizenship, the book itself is titled The Invention of Palestinian Citizenship. And so the main kind of invention, perhaps in, in, in inverted commas, would be the 1925 Citizenship Ordering Council, uh, which actually established an internationally recognized 
citizenship, basically. Um, that that covered both Palestinian, Arab, and Jewish immigrant residents of the territory. However, before 1925, which is sort of the big year that this, this law was actually implemented, there were numerous discussions, uh, disagreements, again, sort of tensions between the British Colonial Office, the British Foreign Office, Home Office, um, all of these different groups over who would ultimately be able to pass a citizenship law in the mandate, whose influence between some of the Zionist organization, Jewish immigrant leaders, Arab leaders, would be the strongest in actually framing this idea of citizenship and nationality. And in the end, in a sense, the 1925 citizenship order con conferred citizenship, I guess, as a legal status, but did not give any sort of rights, obligations, duties. The things we might think of as kind of Republican or liberal notions of citizenship today, or sort of Western ideas of what citizenship was. The order essentially just, um, <clears throat> I suppose, conferred uh, the status itself as an internationally recognized uh, status for those who are living here. Um, and the main, actually, I guess we can, we can say it in the sense of it gave sort of a jurisdiction Um, and what, what the order did as well was, if we think of modern citizenship orders, citizenship laws, most of the people that would be affected by them would be people who are living in a territory. And so citizenship, and this was the same in the Ottoman Empire, was passed either through descent, so, you know, through sort of a bloodline generations, or individuals who were resident in a particular territory were granted this status by right of residency. Uh, and then there was also, of course, the naturalization laws. And so what the citizenship in order in 1925 did was sort of did away with, I guess what we would think of as citizenship passing either by descent or by right of residence. And it was sort of conceived, the order was, was in a sense conceived as perhaps the, the easiest way for Jewish immigrants to receive Palestinian citizenship. And with that citizenship would come residency rights, would come passports, uh, the ability to travel, the ability to be protected diplomatically by British consulates elsewhere. And the citizenship law was also connected with the, the treaties that ended the First World War. So particularly the Treaty of Lausanne. And the difference between this citizenship order and what happened perhaps in other mandated territories and what is different in a sense from what happens in places today is that citizenship was given by domicile only. And so people who were resident in the territory of the mandate of Palestine on the exact date that the order was passed in 1925 were sort of automatically granted citizenship. And of course this was fine and good for those who were actually resident here. Um, and there was also, a, I think, a two-year time frame for those who lived outside of the mandate's borders, but who wanted to, who were born here or who lived here, uh, but who wanted to have, have themselves recognized as, as Palestinian citizens to actually come back. Um, but what the British did was quite interesting in the sense that these people who, for whatever reason, some of you may be familiar with stories of the Palestinian diaspora pre-1948. Uh, and so there are many, many individuals, you know, tens of thousands of Palestinian Arabs, uh, both Christians and Muslims, who left early 20th century. Uh, a lot of them went to the Americas. A lot of them went to Europe, mostly for work. Uh, with the intention, for most of them, of, of eventually returning. So they were still resident here, they still had homes, properties, families, uh, but they were part of this wider movement of labor, essentially, in the early 20th century. And so you have at least 20, 30,000 by the, the end of the 1920s, people who were born within what becomes Palestine, but resident outside. Uh, for, again, whatever reasons, for, for work, but also for education, for travel, 
people who are temporarily resident somewhere else, people who are working in, say, the rail lines in Egypt, people who were in some of the neighboring territories, whose right to actually take on citizenship was effectively canceled by, by the mandate legislation. <clears throat> and so what happens to these immigrants is one of the main focuses, again, of, of the book and how they conceptualized their own, you know, what happens to their nationality. Um, <clears throat> the law, in effect, barred them from returning unless they return to permanently reside in, in the mandate territory. If they couldn't return within um, the very short time frame given, they were sort of out of luck in a sense. Uh, and so the end of the book, I mean, I won't get into this too much, but this is sort of, I don't know if we want to say the first sort of um, <clears throat> uh, incidence of statelessness of Palestinians in the 1920s, those who were not able to return and take on citizenship. And they were not also, I mean, they also didn't come under British diplomatic protection, British consular protection. Um, many of them, and again, as this 1920s, you have also the, the increase in importance of international passports and visas for travel. And so 1926 is the first year that Palestinian passports are printed. And so these individuals were also left without, without passports as well. <clears throat> and so this sort of saga, in a sense, of what happens to these individuals throughout the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s uh, is, is a focus of a couple of chapters in the book and sort of juxtaposed, in a sense, to the way that the citizenship law was applied for Jewish immigrants. Uh, and some of you probably, are, if, if you know a bit about the mandate period, you would know um, <clears throat> the, the mandate legislation allowed, I think, a two-year residency time frame for Jewish immigrants who settled in Palestine to then after two years, if they could say they've been here consistently that, for, for that time period to naturalize as citizens. And so what the book sort of attempts to capture, I, I hope, especially using Arabic press, letters from a lot of these individuals who are outside, back home, discussions in civil society forums, is this struggle for these Arab immigrants to somehow get some sort of diplomatic protection, some sort of citizenship, um, some sort of even temporary uh, nationality status. And what eventually happens by 1947, 1948, is that most of these individuals out of perhaps 30,000, only about 500 were able to come back and were able to take on citizenship without so much of a struggle with the British. And so I think that this story is something that is perhaps not as well known as, of course, 1948, when you think of statelessness, when you think of the right of return, these sort of slogans were also being talked about in 1926. 1927 in the press and newspapers related to these groups who were sort of left outside of Palestine. And it becomes, in that sense, citizenship becomes an incredibly politicized term for the British to have to deal with. All of these letters and petitions coming in from British territories, British colonies, from Great Britain, but also from, from much further afield of individuals trying to somehow negotiate or claim or prove that they were more Palestinian in a sense than the immigrants, which I think is, is a story that many of you would know as well from the nationalist movement in Palestine. But it's something that um, <clears throat> there begins to be a whole separate discourse of citizenship in, in a lot of these forums and nationality in a lot of these forums. Um, and it's something I think that has continued perhaps beyond 1948, this idea of what is citizenship for, for Palestinians. But I guess I think that's probably a much, a much bigger story. How much time do I? Okay. Um, I'll just say a couple of things about some conclusions, some that are, are perhaps in the book and some maybe to think about perhaps in the discussion as well. Um, the citizenship legislation in Palestine was almost entirely colonial, if we think of sort of British imperialism, British colonialism, 
the order itself was passed in London and um, <clears throat> given final approval by, by the government in London. It was never given any kind of uh, perhaps glance over, there was no opportunity for any of the Arab groups to look at this legislation before it became law. And it was actually started, these discussions of what citizenship, how it would look in the mandate, as early as, as, as I said earlier, 1918. Um, the Zionist organization and, and Weizmann had, uh, I suppose, very, again, as some of you know, very um, close links with a lot of the, the earlier British administrators in Palestine. And so many of them were granted a sort of glance over at the citizenship order. But one of the problems that comes out into the 30s, into the 40s was, for, for again, I'm talking sort of discursively um, on, the, on the Arab side, is that we were never given a chance to look at any of this legislation, that this legislation is colonial because it doesn't grant any rights or duties, behaviors of citizenship, etc. And I think perhaps this sort of colonial legislation carried on into the 1940s. I mean, there were several amendments to the law, but none of them took into account. And this also goes for, for the, the Jewish side as well. None of these amendments really took into account any of the concerns or the problems that different groups had with the law, like a lot of legislation during the mandate. <clears throat> I think the law also brought the idea of citizenship and nationality to the front pages of newspapers during the mandate as something that might not have caught the attention of, say, residents of Lebanon or Syria who didn't have the same sort of citizenship law, in, even in Iraq and other British territory in Transjordan. The citizenship laws were passed with the approval of local parliaments, which is something that also happened in other British colonies. But for the case of Mandate Palestine, it was quite different. <clears throat> again, which isn't something unusual. The British had no real reason to give either group in, in the mandate you know, the power to sort of look over laws and actually change them. 1918 as well, the end of the First World War, also instituted this idea, which had been in practice before, of one state or one nation for one specific person. So the idea of the nation state became, you know, it was quite a heavily invested thing by the League of Nations. And this idea still, I think, continued past 1948 to today, that citizenship should be exclusively for one type of group and one type of, of nation state. Today, of course, with ideas of globalized citizenship, it's quite different. But, you know, pre-Cold War, this was something that was quite heavily invested in by the League of Nations and then the United Nations, and of course by, by Great Britain. One thing as well that, as sort of a conclusion, large numbers of Jewish immigrants to Palestine, even by the 1940s, had not decided to naturalize, or those who had been living here before the citizenship law. Uh, they didn't necessarily automatically or, or take the option of automatically becoming Palestinian citizens. So you have, by probably the end of the 1930s, early 1940s, only perhaps a little bit more than half of, of those resident here, Jewish immigrants who were resident in, in the Mandate Palestine, actually had the paperwork or had naturalized as Palestinian citizens. And this was something that the British recognized, and also that was quite heavily talked about in Arabic newspapers, that there was this group of residents, you know, huge numbers of people who were not citizens, but who were residents. Um, <clears throat> and again, this is another, another sort of point of contention that, that the book goes into a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> and I think issues of citizenship today, sort of, if... Um, if I can go a little bit in, into the sort of contemporary period. As some of you, I'm sure, know, there is no Palestinian citizenship law in, passed by, by the PLO or by the Palestinian Authority. 
But there is still a kind of tension between citizenship versus nationality. If there were to be some sort of citizenship law, what would it actually grant? Would it be like the mandate law, a kind of jurisdictional citizenship? Or would it actually grant rights such as voting, um, right of residence, etc., to Palestinians in the diaspora, to refugees, uh, to Palestinians who have taken on another nationality or another citizenship. There's still kind of unresolved issues as well between sort of the eusanguinous principle of, of citizenship and nationality, so passed by, by descent and passed by residents in a particular territory. Again, this, this for, for the, the Palestinian Authority, how to actually grant citizenship when huge numbers of, of individuals who had been mandate citizens or their descendants are spread so far and wide in the diaspora. Um, <clears throat> there were several attempts, obviously, to, to pass some citizenship orders by the PLO and also by, um, by the PA. There were draft laws, but they haven't yet been passed. And so, again, this idea of Palestinian citizenship and the invention of it, I suppose, is kind of an... an um, an ongoing process. It's not something that was only sort of confined to the mandate and to the 1920s, 1930s. Um, and then I, I suppose the last thing is this tension as well with after 1948 and especially after the, the Israeli um, <clears throat> nationality law, what happens to Palestinians who are living within Israel? What happens to their citizenship and their nationality if there were to be a citizenship law passed sometime in the future? Uh, would it resemble the mandate law where domicile or having some sort of proof of, of residence would grant particular thing would yeah grant particular things? How would rights be granted? Again, um, <clears throat> the issue of citizenship is something that, that is also quite contemporary as well. But what I hope to show in the book is the historicization of the terminology itself, of the ideas of what citizenship and nationality meant to different groups during the mandate, and also how those ideas and those discourses evolved up until 1947. So I'll hand that over to Mandy and Salim. Thank you. me, Mandy, and thanks to Lauren Banco for this uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, I have few comments on my reading of uh, the invention of Palestinian citizenship. Is this working? Uh, which I read. Uh, on my, the, I can only read it on an electronic uh, platform because the book was not available. So that's why my eyes seem to be glazed at the moment. <laughs> I'm not used to read the whole book uh, in such a fashion. Uh, <clears throat> I think the title is very exciting because uh, it refers to the construction of notions of nationality uh, out of the residual features of the Ottoman uh, notions of identity and citizenship that existed before. And one of the, to me, one of the most exciting uh, features of this book is the debate which was started by Hafisha mm. on uh, Palestinian nationality law and how it evolved uh, after the Sykes-Picot Agreement from the breakup of the Ottoman Empire. You devote one of the chapters in your book to Osman Lilik, which is the ideology propagated by the post-Tanzimat Ottoman reforms on creating an overarching citizenship out of the ideas of subjecthood. And this was, of course, the first time in the modern Middle East, where notions of overarching imperial citizenship emerged. Uh, Osman Lilik is, of course, 
uh, much more than um, a, a law of citizenship. It's an ideology of imperial belonging and identity. And uh, in, in the case of Lerner, uh, Banco's work, it perhaps uh, would lead us to think of the reinvention of Palestinian citizenship rather than invention. Uh, but I want to ask you a few questions about this in a moment. Uh, one, another very interesting uh, introduction in this book is how the diasporic community which uh, found itself uh, out of the domain of the uh, mandate uh, Palestine and also, of course, mandate Syria and Lebanon, were unable to claim this colonial citizenship which was established by the uh, citizenship order of 1925, I think, and then reiterated after the Second Amendment of 1939. Uh, these people were lobbying very hard, very systematically, to be able to come back to Palestine and claim this colonial citizenship. And uh, Lauren Bankos uses the expression, uh, the first occurrence of the notion of the right of return. Uh, and this idea of what happened to people who were left out of the territories of Mandate Palestine, but were still Ottoman citizens, uh, many of them went to Latin America. I think you mentioned the case of Chile, uh, El Salvador, uh, but a substantial number of which who were in Egypt for uh, purposes of uh, labor migration, professional mobility. They were cut out, and in theory, the mandate government recognized that former Ottoman citizens of Palestine and the other mandated territories have the right to claim uh, the colonial citizenship of the mandate, but in practice they were denied. And the process of debating that, especially in the Latin American Arabic press, uh, as well as in the local press, uh, which became a platform for uh, uh, demanding the rights, was not realized except until 1939, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it was realized, um, and th this is all new to me. I was fascinating part of uh, Lawrence's book. It was not uh, applied in practice. Uh, very few, uh, out of uh, what thirty thousand people, a few hundred people were able actually to implement the right of return uh, uh, claim to Palestinian citizenship. And why did that happen? I find your discussion rather obscure. Perhaps you can explain it here, but. Uh, basically, uh, I understand you're saying that uh, they had already settled, they established uh, rights and privileges and could not uh, claim this. What happened actually was bureaucratic arrangements stood up to them and uh, did, not, uh, did not make it able for them to realize by the right of patrimony uh, of their, because by then, they were probably second generation people. They could not make this claim. But it establishes precedence. And that precedence is very important for the implications of uh, notions of citizenship for us today, after 48, after the establishment of the Palestinian Authority, after the Oslo Agreement, and given the creation of uh, what you term stateless citizenship by the PA, mm. a, a truncated kind of citizenship, and another truncated citizenship for part of the Palestinians who remained in the state of Israel after 48. Uh, I think one of the most, uh, uh, one of the richest and most interesting feature of this book is that it discusses nationality law and citizenship rights in a broader non-juridical uh, aspect. It does discuss the juridical features, but those were already done in a rather technical way by uh, Hafisha, who wrote a PhD on the same subject. And what Lauren Banco does is that she uh, uh, examines the broader aspects of uh, citizenship, colonial citizenship, the difference between uh, nationality and citizenship, 
and most importantly, the debates that were going on during the mandate by a variety of groups, political parties, and what she calls uh, civic society associations. Of course, that's a new term. But it's thrown mm. backward. Uh, the most important of which were the creation of mass uh, political movements, political parties, which did not exist before except in a very embryonic uh, way under the Ottomans, mm -hmm. by the Arabic press and also by civic associations like the labor movement, which you did not really discuss in any substantial way, uh, women's groups and so on. Those debates are very exciting and very interesting to look at now in terms of notions of entitlement. And my first question to you is how are these debates fleshed out in terms of uh, how uh, people who wrote about it in the press, in political parties, in mass uh, demonstrations, uh, in terms of rights? Because my reading of your book is that these civic associations were actually protesting the discriminatory features of colonial citizenship. Why is it that the Jewish agency, the Jewish immigrants, uh, the application, the creation of the notion of Jewish national home embedded in the, in the uh, uh, embedded in the terms of the mandate, were not extended to Palestinian Arabs, uh, especially in terms of the return of refugees, mm. uh, the uh, giving rights to Ottoman. Palestinians who were living in Chile and El Salvador and Egypt, and they were not given the right to, to come back the way the Jewish immigrants were. Given. So it was a negative kind of protest, and I see the positive articulation of these uh, notions of entitlement uh, not clear to me. I, I wish you could tell us more about how they were articulated. You, you mention a very interesting uh, position put forth by one of the last remaining Ottomans in Palestine, which is Musa Qasim Hussein, who was uh, mayor of Jerusalem and head of the Arab executive. Uh, he died in the 30s, but he put forth a very vigorous um, challenge to the British mandate nationality law. And uh, interestingly enough, he puts forth a position that uh, what we need is a universal application of citizenship rights in a country which is uh, ostensibly colonial, but actually was a mandate by the League of Nations. And everybody should get the citizenship in an equal way. Uh, so that position is very interesting, but then you describe two phases in which Arab responses to colonial citizenship evolved. Mm -hmm. One in which Musa Qasim's position uh, uh, represented that everybody should be equal before the law and uh, uh, in, in nationality law should actually be a reincarnation of the Ottoman nationality law. I think this is what he was saying, right. but that's what I understand you're saying. But then you say something else. You say in the 30s, as the rebellion took place, mm. uh, the, something happened as if the Arab national movement internalized the terms of the mandate and accepted the idea that Palestine is made up not of citizens but of two nation, national groups. Mm. And by doing so, they retracted from Musa Qasim Hussein's position and asked for uh, end of the mandate and a form of representation in which uh, the Jews would be another nationality. Mm. In other words, instead of pushing for equal citizenship for everybody, the parliamentary system, uh, uh, they actually retracted partly as a result of the rebellion, but partly they seem to have uh, internalized the Zionist enterprise and accepted the idea that the two uh, nationalities. At least this is how I understand you, you're saying, but I'm not sure mm. if that's what you're saying. Uh, 
The last point I want to raise <coughs> is the whole idea is embedded in uh, the partition plan and uh, UN Resolution 181 as far as this uh, question of citizenship is concerned. In the first case, the partition plan created uh, an Arab an, uh, potential nationality, a Jewish potential nationality, but also a synthetic, hybridic uh, fusion nationality. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. Yeah. It's the uh, uh, citizenship of people living in Greater Jerusalem, mm -hmm. which uh, actually was an embryonic form of binationalism. And that was offered to a very large uh, number of people who were living in the center of Palestine at the time. Of course, this was never realized, and it was left to resolution to 181 to rectify the consequences of the War of 48. And uh, as a result, uh, the idea of what happens, the refugee hood became at the center of the redefinition of Palestinian nationalities. How do you restore rights to these people? And it was stuck on the question of demographics. Where will they go? What will happen to them? Compensation and so on. Rather than addressing the question of the citizenship of these people, uh, which is, of course, a, a very big gap in that discussion, which was only taken over in the 1990s after the Oslo Agreement. Mm. And what one of the uh, more interesting, I mean, there are many interesting things in the discussion, is the, the whole implication of this to three uh, solutions to the nationality law for Palestinians. One, we have in, in negative terms, which is the Egyptian uh, adoption of the government of all Palestine in, in Gaza and the denial of citizenship to Palestinians, which what happened in, uh, in, in all the Arab countries except Jordan. And uh, in Jordan, we have the Hashemite solution, which is creation of an overarching citizenship for Palestinians and Jordanians. And the whole uh, uh, discussion then was that the denial of citizenship, Egyptian or Lebanese or Syrian, to the Palestinians had to do with asserting the right of return. So it was a, an exclusion whose end result was a ideological intervention on what will happen to the Palestinians. And I wish you, you had discussed this more in terms of the logjam of what happened uh, in, in the War of 48 uh, as a consequence. Mm -hmm. And the, the other one, of course, is the non-citizenship granted to Palestinians in the occupied territories after 1994, 95, mm -hmm. I, I can't <clears throat> remember when, by the PA. And that is a form of a nationality law or nationality non-law which has always been transitional mm. uh, because it always thought that the end result will be the creation of sovereign state which can grant, uh, grant uh, nationality. But actually, the nationality law uh, proposed by the Palestinian Authority has much more to it than you seem to suggest in your discussion. Mm. You, I think you're stuck, or not stuck, but you're uh, uh, overwhelmed with the absence of sovereignty mm. and the truncated nature of this uh, nationality. But actually, it has a potentiality of uh, rectifying the absence of citizenship that is lacking because of the colonial impositions by the Israelis on, on how this citizenship is granted, how it, proce how it proceeds. And uh, of course, uh, the granting of identity cards here is given only through the approval of the Palestinians. And Jerusalem is left out of it. So I want to ask you to elaborate how these earlier debates during the mandate by Civic Society Association and notions of entitlement had relevance 
on rectifying the current debate about uh, nationality law for Palestinians in occupied countries and mm. occupied regions. Mm. Um, okay, I, I think this is enough for, uh, for raising the <laughs> discussion point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was that. There is quite a lot of, um, as I said at the beginning, there's a lot more that can be done on this particular topic, and I think a lot of Salim's questions bring out perhaps some of the nuances of both the history of nationality and citizenship, and then obviously the contemporary um, implications, I suppose. Maybe, to, oh, I guess I'll start from, from the first question. This idea of, of entitlement and how were notions of entitlement fleshed out or articulated in debates going on during the mandate. I should first maybe say that these notions or debates of entitlement were completely at odds with the British conception of colonial citizenship, which didn't carry any sort of entitlement or rights. The British, maybe more so than thinking of the Palestinians as citizens in a rights-bearing sense, thought of them as subjects. Still in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, even though sort of British imperial power and subjecthood was having a bit less of, had a bit less of a relevance. Um, but the British saw the Palestinians, I think, very much in terms of subjecthood. Um, if they were to be granted any rights with the citizenship law, it would be rights to imperial or diplomatic protection while they were traveling. So in an international sense, the law conveyed something for those Palestinians, both Arab and Jewish, um, and also some British and other European individuals did naturalize. Um, but the only right they sort of had was, was protection while abroad. For those who were actually here in Mandate Palestine or who were stuck somewhere, there was no, you know, there wasn't any kind of right at all or any sort of, uh, of entitlement. And so these, Debates, I suppose, over rights to entitlement. In the way I understand it and conceptualize it in the book, came from perhaps post-Tanzimat ideas of Arab nationality and the idea that there was an all-encompassing Arab nationality. Perhaps not in the sense of a political, you know, politically sovereign nationality, but that there was a sort of separateness. Um, that encompassed the Arabs in the Ottoman territories. And so there was a sort of cultural, civic, social identity that was expressed in the terminology of, of nationality, late 19th century, early 20th century. And through that idea of, of Arab majority nationality in Palestine came some of these debates to rights on the basis that the Arabs were the majority nationality in Palestine. And this is another way that these terms sort of change throughout the mandate period. Nationality starts off as something related maybe to more of a cultural or I guess we could say an ethnic sense of identity and an idea of being in the majority in terms of residency in the mandate territories and morphs into something by the end of the mandate that's more like contemporary citizenship we would think of today. And even the terminology in the citizenship law, the British translations of it into Arabic and the Arabic uh, press reports always referred to it as a nationality law until a couple of years after it was passed. And then the term, oh, sorry, the term citizenship becomes more prominent. And so there are these sort of nuances between terminology used and where I guess a sense of entitlement comes from linked to this idea I mentioned in the book there's this, this conception of communitarian citizenship, which is very much linked to thoughts about majority nationality um, in a more social sense, civic sense, even political sense, that the majority should have some sort of right to pass laws, to pass citizenship laws, of course, but also to you know, have a constitution, to have some kind of governmental responsibilities and governmental duties. Um, so I don't know that that, that sort of maybe begins to answer the question of entitlement, uh, stemming, again, related to what Salim started off with talking about, Ottoman notions 
of Osman Lilik and, um, and what that sort of changed into. And there are probably through the 1930s as well, lots of different discussions and debates in the Arabic press for sure. Um, and also among some of the, the Arabs who were left sort of outside of Palestine to move towards sort of a common citizenship for the Arab world. And this was sort of an ideal that once the mandates were gone, uh, once there was no longer need for the British and the French to be in what had been the Ottoman provinces of, um, the Arab provinces, I'm sorry, of the Ottoman Empire, that there would be a move towards an idea of an Arab citizenship that encompassed everyone living in the entire region, but that would be based on this sort of late 19th century notion of, which was quite perhaps new and modern at the time, of Arab nationality. <clears throat> and these, these were also the debates that were going on in the, what becomes, I suppose, this permanent diaspora as well. And as Salim did mention, you know, these, these discussions of, of entitlement went as far as to, to be claims for the right of return in, you know, phrased in the exact same way that we have after 1948, only it's coming in, in the 1920s, referring to something quite different, but, you know, the same language is used, the same sort of fears are quite evident in some of these writings of if many of these Arabs are not given the right to return, there is going to be the, the very real possibility that Palestine will become a Jewish national homeland because it will be populated by people, Jewish immigrants who take on Palestinian citizenship while those in the diaspora are not able to take on this citizenship. So there was this fear also of, of a kind of imbalance as well. <clears throat> um, so I'll try and move on a bit more quickly, actually, for, for questions. But for the second question, this, this um, uh, maybe juxtaposition of Musa Qasim's idea of sort of an equal citizenship during the early years of the mandate for everyone to come under the same laws, to be granted the same rights to settle and to take on citizenship automatically or through naturalization, etc. But then, Zalim is right, after or during, really, the Arab Revolt in the 1930s, and especially with the, um, the Peel Commission in 1937, there it comes to, to the fore, in a sense, the British idea that, well, if we partition Palestine, and again, this is the 1937 partition plan, then we can just allow for two separate nationalities. There wouldn't necessarily be a common citizenship um, but we would have in some sort of Arab nationality for, for those who are Arab living in particular areas, um, and then a Jewish nationality for those who were in the, the Jewish part of what would, well, what was assumed to be, but quite quickly was shot down, uh, a partitioned Palestine. Um, and so I think the Peel Commission also influenced this idea and sort of the run-up to it, some of the, the main people consulted, the Arabs consulted by the Peel Commission, um, which I don't think were, were very many because it was boycotted at first, but there was this so shift to the understanding that perhaps there should be two separate nationalities uh, and this idea of Palestinian citizenship that was, that was in law maybe didn't have so much of a meaning anymore in light of the Arab revolt, the ideas to actually partition Palestine uh, and also planning for the future of, in 1937, you know, this is still not when the British are, are at their strongest point during the revolt, there was this idea that, hey, maybe the British can leave and we can actually be able to pass some sort of sovereign citizenship law, on the Arab side anyway. Um, and then the last question is probably the most difficult, I think, of uh, um, how to make these earlier debates of citizenship relevant to... I suppose the contemporary ideas of, of what's, um, what the situation is for both refugees, um, Palestinians who, who are living without, with, without citizenship as refugees, those who are living in Israel, those who are, well, Jordanian citizens now. I suppose I'm not entirely sure how to really formulate an answer. If, yeah, if others have some sort of ideas, for sure. I mean, as you mentioned, Mutez Kafiche has, has talked about this quite a bit, how to actually 
make these ideas of what happened in the mandate relevant to now, uh, and it's it's incredibly it's incredibly difficult, I think. So, but we can come back to this perhaps. <laughs>